certainly has been great to be here again this morning to worship our Father. Thank you for being here. We have a great crowd. I know we have a number of visitors. If you have any Bible questions, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to study the Word of God with you. If you have your Bible, open it up to Mark chapter 2. We'll begin our study there in just a moment. Mark chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I wanted to share a couple of photos with you. Last year, and I mentioned this before, I had the opportunity to go to, uh, to Israel and to visit the land where Jesus lived and uh, the, the places where we read about all throughout the Word of God. And it was an amazing experience. And one of my favorite places, I think, that, um, that I enjoyed the most uh, seeing was uh, the town of Capernaum. And w- this is a photo here of just um, uh, of the town of Capernaum. It says, Capernaum, the town of Jesus, the house of Simon Peter, and the synagogue. We know Jesus spent a great deal of time uh, in this city or this town. In Mark chapter 1 and verse number 21, if you want to turn over there, and we'll get to Mark 2 here in just a moment, we find Jesus in Capernaum. The Bible says they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. While you're over there, there are lots of places where people say this is believed to be the place where Jesus was, or this was a location where we think this may have happened. When you look at this city here, we know that he was there. Uh, We know that he was uh, in that area, in that place, in the synagogue. And what's interesting there, uh, this is a photo of uh, the foundation of the synagogue. And there's a sign that says the late 4th century A.D. So the white part, the white bricks, are the the foundation from the 4th century. Then it says, built upon the remains of the synagogue of Jesus. And so that black portion is from the 1st century synagogue. So it really is impressive to know as we read about the synagogue in the Bible in, in Capernaum, that Jesus was there. And let me just share with you a couple of other photos. This is another photo that I took uh, looking at the synagogue there from, uh, from the first, fourth century there. And here's another bigger view uh, of what it looks like. This photo here uh, are still some of the remains that are there in the town. So it's, it's not a big place, but it certainly is uh, an amazing place. We know that he was there in the synagogue. What's interesting as well, in Mark chapter 1 and verse number 29, we know that uh, Simon Peter uh, apparently lived there as well. I have a photo of that, but I didn't put it in the slide. Uh, There's a place where they believe the house of Simon Peter was. In Mark 1 and verse 29, it says, And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And Jesus is going to perform a miracle there. So it's just amazing to see how close all of these things really are uh, in that city. Now, I'm saying all of this because I want us to study from Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, our study today is really going to take place in the first 12 verses. And we find Jesus, again in verse number 1, when he had come back to Capernaum. And we're going to see Jesus perform a miracle in Mark chapter 2. It's an amazing story. Uh, It's a very encouraging story. And while he performs a miracle, I think there are some great lessons for us to consider as we think about our faith. Our theme, if you remember, is arise and build, and we are building our faith. And I believe there are some valuable lessons from these 12 verses here that we're going to look at that will help us as we think about the kind of faith that we need to have, the kind of faith that's going to be pleasing to our Father in heaven. So I want to invite you to read along with me, please, from Mark chapter 2. The first 12 verses, our thoughts are going to come from these 12 verses. And as I'm reading, I want you to think about the the people we're going to be introduced to and maybe even try to put yourself in their shoes and see what they're experiencing, all right? So look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even the door, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get him because of the crowd, get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, What does this man speak, or why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up. And immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Isn't this an amazing story? Did you pick up on some things with respect to faith and what we might be able to learn when it comes to the kind of faith that we need to have to be pleasing to God? I want to begin by first suggesting that we need to have great faith, that This is the kind of faith that we see in this story. We read about the paralytic and these four men that were with him, and we know that they knew some things about Jesus. You go back to chapter 1 and verse number 33, we know that his fame had spread, that everybody wanted to be with him, be near him, be around him. Look at verse 33 of Mark chapter 1. And the whole city had gathered at the door. And verse number 37 of Mark chapter 1, Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And then in verse number 45 of chapter 1, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. So everyone wanted to be where Jesus was. They wanted to be in his presence, including this man who was a paralytic and these four men, his friends, that were with him. So when we get to chapter 2, we see that Jesus, he was in a house, and the house was crowded. It was packed, no more room. But what is so fascinating is that nothing was going to get in the way of these men and that paralytic from getting in front of Jesus. You talk about faith. They had great faith. Their mentality was, by any means necessary, we're going to get our friend or this man in front of Jesus. The crowd wasn't going to stop them, and not even a roof was going to stop them. Did you pick up on what the Bible says there in Mark chapter 2? And they, in verse 3, they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, I I want you to think about that for a second. This isn't something that's probably going to take just a few seconds. They are removing a roof, and they are digging inside of the roof. How is that going to look if you're in that house? Uh, Do you hear something? No, no, keep going. There's there's something going on on the roof. I want you to take note of of how how confident they were that nothing was going to get in the way. We have to get to Jesus. This man needs to be in front of Jesus. Jesus can heal this man. And so digging in the roof, that is something not to take lightly. Nothing was going to get in their way. They weren't concerned about what others were going to say either. I mean, if you're in the house, wouldn't you be a little bit uh, nervous about what's going on? And if I was on top of the roof, I'd be nervous about someone coming out and saying, what are you doing? You're messing up my home. They weren't concerned about that at all. They needed to get to Jesus. And my other question that I have for them is, how long did this take? It had to take more than just a a few minutes. It took probably a long period of time. I think we could describe the type of faith that they had as radical in nature. Because who's digging through a roof to get to Jesus? And Jesus certainly sees their faith, and he commends them. In Mark chapter 2 and verse number 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, and I often think about just the paralytic and the the faith that the paralytic had, but it says Jesus seen their faith. So it seems to be encompassing all of them, saying, son, your sins are forgiven. And one of the things that I often think about, something that I've thought about lately, was this man disappointed when he heard the words of Jesus? Why were they digging through the roof? So that he could be healed. What's the first thing Jesus says to him? Your sins are forgiven. Do you think there may have been some disappointment on that man and even the other people, the four men that are digging in the Wait a second. No, we want you to heal him, Jesus. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. 
And when you think about that, how embarrassing would that have been for the paralytic? Jesus is calling you out in front of everyone with respect to your sins. And he's saying, son, your sins are forgiven, forgiven. It's an amazing encounter. We know this, that this man and his friends, they had great faith. And we know the rest of the story, that Jesus eventually is going to heal this man. And nothing got in their way. And that was the type of confidence and trust. They knew about the miracles that Jesus had performed. They heard the things, and they knew that this was the man that they needed. And I want you to think about this just for a moment. This is a kind of faith that is pleasing to God. Jesus saw their faith, and certainly he was commending them about the kind of faith that they had. And brothers and sisters, this is the kind of faith that we need to have. We need to have great faith in our Father great faith in Jesus, radical faith, if you want to describe it in that manner. And there's so much application for us to think about. We've talked about evangelism for three months. Let's talk about it for three more minutes, okay? Think about evangelism for a second here. These men, if they were his friends, whoever they were, nothing was going to get in their way. And I want you to think about that for a moment. That's the kind of faith that we need as we spread the word of Jesus Christ. When we think about our family members, we need to have this kind of faith that nothing is going to get in our way to get our loved ones in front of Jesus, to help them to see the truth concerning Jesus. And as we think about our families, we need to ask ourselves, how far am I truly willing to go to help save my family, to help save my friend, to help save that person that I love, to help save that person that I know is in need of spiritual healing by Jesus Christ? That's the kind of faith that we need to have. That's the kind of faith that is going to be pleasing to God. But it's not just with respect to evangelism. Do we have this kind of faith to do God's will, even when everyone else around us may be telling us not to do something? Do we have the kind of faith that's going to be pleasing to God, even when others around us may look at us as being odd or weird? Do we want to have this faith, the faith that's going to be commended by Jesus, that's going to be seen by Jesus, then it's going to require us truly trusting in him, realizing that he is the answer, that he is the one that we need in all aspects of our lives. We need to have great faith. That's one of the lessons we learn from this story. And we need to have the kind of faith that even when we don't have all the answers, even when we don't have all the answers, even when we are tired, even when Jesus may not respond in the manner in which we think that he should, we are going to trust in him. That's the kind of faith that we need to have. This man and those men who were with them, with him, they had great faith. It was radical in nature, digging through a roof. Who does that? That's what they did because they knew Jesus was the answer. And as you think back to this story here, did you pick up on who else is in the story? Did you pick up who else is in the house? They had to go to the roof to get in the house, but there were some other individuals in the house. Look back in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So we find someone else is in the house, the scribes. I believe another uh, gospel talks about the Pharisees also being there as well. And so you find the scribes and the Pharisees also in the house. And that's interesting as well, isn't it? That they are there listening to Jesus as he is teaching the word of God. So they're going to see all of this. They're going to see this man digging through the roof. And they're going to see what Jesus, they heard what Jesus said. And Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. And certainly they were right about the fact who can forgive sins but God alone. Only God can forgive sins, and Jesus is going to demonstrate to them that indeed he is God, the Son of Man, God in the flesh. But what's interesting about this is that these same individuals, they heard the word of God. They saw these miracles. They would have been aware of the miracles that Jesus had performed earlier in his ministry. And yet, they don't have faith in him. Now, while they hear and while they see We're going to find out, as you read throughout the Gospel of Mark or really any other Gospel, that these are going to be the enemies of Jesus. And what you find, a a simple reading, look at chapter 3 and verse number 1. In chapter 3 and verse number 1, the Bible says, He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see 
if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. So these men are going to see the power of God. They're going to hear his words. And yet all throughout this gospel, what we find is that they are the enemies. Their hearts are hardened. They hear, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't truly believe. And what else is interesting about this is that they were close to Jesus. Even in this story here, in Mark chapter 2, with respect to proximity, they're in the same house. And these were the, the experts, so to speak, with respect to the scriptures. And yet by the end of the story in Mark chapter 2, whose faith is being commended? It's not the scribes, but it's the paralytic and the men that were with him. The scribes were right with what they said. Who can forgive sins except God? And Jesus certainly demonstrated that he had the authority and the power not only to heal but also to forgive sins. Well, you know what else is interesting is that the scribes, they should have had great faith in God as well. They should have great faith in Jesus as well. And yet we see that they didn't. As we think about our faith, as we think about the faith that's pleasing to God, this radical faith, if you want to describe it in this manner, that this man and his, his, the men that were with him had. Something else that we need to think about is that one must hear and believe to have great faith. Just because one may be, quote, unquote, close to Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have great faith. One is going to have to hear and, and truly believe. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And yet what we find here is that these individuals, they heard and saw a lot, and yet they didn't truly believe. As we think about our faith, not only do we have to hear, but we're truly going to have to believe what God says in his word. And I want you to really think about this, ponder this for a second, that there are many Christians who will gather together on the first day of the week and hear God's word and still may not have the kind of faith that is growing and that is pleasing to God. You think about sometimes seeing brothers and sisters that slowly and surely fall away. The last few years, I've thought about just some individuals that I have met and something that has come up in numerous conversations just in different places is that I'll meet somebody and they'll say, yes, I, used to, I, I grew up in the church uh, and I used to go to church all the time and, and they're no longer doing that anymore. And it appears that they're no longer even walking with Jesus Christ. Their desire for the Lord is gone. They heard a lot and they went to services quite a bit growing up. And they were surrounded by the word of God and others around them, but there was something lacking with respect to their faith. And how many times have we seen brothers and sisters, members of a local congregation, who even may be attending worship services for years, and yet maybe they're not where they need to be, or yet, even worse, they fall away from the Lord. You see, one can be in the house of worship in Bible classes and still not have necessarily faith that is pleasing to God, which means that we're really going to have to hear his word. We're going to have to really believe it. We're going to have to hide it. And we're certainly going to have to apply it. The scribes and the Pharisees, they saw the miracles of Jesus. They saw his power. They heard his teaching. They were there when he did all of these things. And yet they still didn't believe. They still lacked faith. And I think there's great application for us many times. And it certainly is a blessing to be able to grow up among uh, family members that are Christians that are a part of the body of Christ. And yet at times, I think there can also be a danger where growing up in the body of Christ in the church doesn't mean that you just hit the cruise control button. It doesn't mean that, well, I, I've grown up in the church and so everything is good. I'm, I'm exactly where I need to be. Well, we need to make sure that we have our shield of faith. You can't wear somebody else's shield of faith and I can't wear yours and they can't wear yours. We have to have our own faith in God and Christ. And our children need to make sure that they have their shield of faith. We know that this can happen. Because in our, in our Bible class, in the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer talked about making sure that we listen more carefully to the word of God so that we don't drift away, so that we don't have a hardened heart. It can happen. It can happen very easily. And these men here, they were in the house. They saw all the power of Christ, and yet they still would not believe, which means that when it comes to our faith, we all must walk with Jesus. We all must hear and truly believe his words, truly believe the miracles that have been recorded for us. This is how we're truly going to be pleasing to him. And as we think about Jesus and our faith, you go back to that story in Mark chapter 2. 
I think there's another lesson that we can learn from it. As we think about our faith, we need to know that we have sufficient evidence to have great faith in Christ. We have all the evidence that we need. And again, the paralytic and the scribes, what's fascinating when you start to compare these two groups, they both had the same evidence. They both would have been aware of the, the miracles taking place in Mark chapter 1. They would see the paralytic in Mark chapter 2, as it says, uh, in verse number 10 or verse number 11, where Jesus said, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God. They all saw that. And yet what we find, again, was that the scribes didn't truly believe. But it wasn't because there was a lack of evidence. There was sufficient evidence for them to believe. And it was the evidence of, the, of what Jesus had done to, to motivate the paralytic and these men to go to him so that he might be healed. Sometimes people say, well, if there's just more evidence out there, I would truly believe. Well, we have all the evidence we need in this book. The problem is never with the evidence. The problem is always with our hearts. In John chapter 20, we'll leave Mark here for just a second. In John chapter 20, at the end of his gospel, he reminds us that what we have in this book, it is sufficient, and we don't need to look for any more evidence. What we have in this book is sufficient for us to truly believe. In John chapter 20, after the resurrection of Jesus, after Thomas saw Jesus alive, after he touched his side and saw his hands, and Jesus told him not to be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But take note of what he says here. But these have been written so that you may believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We have all the evidence we need to believe. We've never seen Jesus, but that's okay. Because he has left us with evidence in his word to know that indeed he is the Son of the living God. So we don't have some kind of blind faith. We can have confidence and trust and know because of what has been revealed in God's word by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people will often say, well, if I can just have more evidence, I'll have more faith. Well, that actually may be demonstrating a lack of faith because you have sufficient evidence right here in this book. The scribes and the Pharisees had all these occasions that we read about to see Jesus perform these miracles. And yet they would often still ask for a sign. In Mark chapter 8, we see a case of this in Mark chapter 8 and verse number 11. In Mark chapter 8 and verse number 11, we see the problem. While they were asking for something, we see the problem was right here. The problem was in their hearts. In Mark chapter 8 and verse number 11, the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. They had already been given all the evidence that they essentially needed. And as we think about this point here, as the people of God, as we think about our faith and arising and building in our faith, and especially for young people here, especially for those who may be in college or even in high school, believe and know and examine the evidence. There's nothing wrong doing that. There's nothing wrong asking questions. But know that you don't need to be looking for more evidence or asking God for more evidence to believe because what we have in this book, it is sufficient. And so the question really becomes, will we have the faith to believe what's written? Will we have the faith to truly stand on what God has already done? Think about what God has already done. And think about what Jesus has already done. Jesus has already proven himself to be God in the flesh. We've seen his power. We know that he is eternal. We know that he is good. We know that he is trustworthy. We know that what we have here is reliable. And as we think about what sometimes some people in the world may struggle with, sometimes people say, look, just give me some more evidence and then I'll believe. I want you to think about this as we begin to wrap this up. While it's easy sometimes to look at people in the world who may ask for more evidence, just give me a little bit more and then I'll believe, do we ever struggle with that ourselves? Do we really believe what we have in this book? We need to really ponder that for a moment. 
Do we ever find ourselves asking God just to prove himself one more time so that we'll continue to believe, that we'll continue to remain with him? If we do, then maybe we need to go back and reconsider some things. He's already proven himself. He already died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. He's proven himself to be reliable. And it's our responsibility to believe. You go back to this story in Mark chapter 2, with the paralytic and these men and the miracle that Jesus performed. It's a great story. It's a great story about the power of Christ and who he is. It's a great story where we can learn about our faith, the faith that is ultimately going to be pleasing to him. So I want to end with some questions here. Where is my faith and where is your faith this morning? Are we like the paralytic and, his, and these men, his friends, or are we more like the scribes? What kind of faith do we have? And then I want you to think about this. What will Jesus see when he looks at our faith? He saw their faith, and he saw that they truly believed in him. Let's make sure that Jesus sees that we trust fully in him. Let's have great faith. and Let's rely upon our Father in heaven and his Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention this morning. We're going to sing the song of invitation here in just a moment. As we think about faith, maybe there's someone here that has not yet been converted to Jesus Christ. Maybe you have not yet been redeemed from your sins. Maybe you're still lost in your sins. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, you're still lost in your sins. But you need to have faith that Jesus is the Son of the living God. Are you willing to confess that you believe that? Are you willing to truly change, to turn away from your sins? through repentance and are you willing to get up and to be baptized and to wash away your sins calling on the name of the lord do you have faith in him and what he's able to do for you if so then act right now if you're subject to the invitation